Kool-Aid Man's Pavlov Podcast episode number five is live on the air, and I am just so happy that you are joining us. As always, we're going to have a wonderful jam-packed episode with so much great stuff to talk about, and later in this episode, we have a real treat. We'll be joined by Foxtrot of the bankrupt Pavlov development team, and Foxtrot will be talking about all the work he's been doing on Pavlov Shack and a whole bunch more, so stay tuned for that. But first, as always, let's start off with some Dave Leaks. And as you can see, it's been a busy while here for the Vancrup team as they continue to chug along with the engine upgrade. The good news is it seems like it's going better than ever, and a release candidate is expected as early as next week, according to Dave and his latest messages on Twitter and on Discord. We're also getting our first look at industry which is a map that will be coming to Pavlov Shack on the Oculus Quest. And boy, oh boy, is this looking great in terms of the blockout and some of the optimization that they're doing. Can't wait to play Industry, a very popular map on PC already. So we're excited to see that on Shack. And also we got our first look here at Stalingrad. So we're excited to see, I guess, maybe Shackengrad coming soon. But it's looking very, very cool and staying tuned to see more great improvements on that map. Also this week, Dave announced that with the new release candidate dropping soon, they'll be stopping official support for the Quest 1. It simply doesn't have the memory to be doing all the processing that's needed with the upgrade to Pavlov Shack. Turning to other exciting news, we got a leak from the QA team, the Quality Assurance team, showing that Pavlov Shack now has working smokes in the dev build. So very, very exciting stuff. I know us in the Shack community have wanted smokes for a long time and very excited to see the progress that they're making. I hope this makes it into the forthcoming release candidate version so that we can test this out. But boy, they're looking really cool. And without a doubt, this is going to change a lot of the tactics and strategies, especially for s and <music> Ladies and gentlemen, we're so, so happy to have Foxtrot joining us today. Foxtrot, as many of you know, is one of the Vankrupt team. He's a, a dev there with them, and we see him often in Discord, and even if you're lucky, you can catch him in game sometimes. So Foxtrot, welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to hear about all the stuff you've been up to and learn more about what you do. Thanks, Kool-Aid. Thanks for having me, man. Um, I'm a 3D modeler at Vankrupt. I worked on the hide game mode and TTT exclusively, uh, developing all the little gadgets and things that you use, the knives and whatnot. I've done a lot of the, the skins that are coming as well as worked on the core system lately. But yeah, that's pretty much what I got going on right now. So, I mean, you are a busy, busy man and you've hit a couple of big keywords that everybody's just so excited about. Skins, we're talking about weapon skins specifically. And of course, that gore, can you give us a little bit of insight? What, what does this process look like? I know a lot of folks have been anxiously awaiting the RC and the update, uh, but this stuff doesn't happen overnight, right, my friend? The gore system is extremely complicated from a technical aspect with actual programming logic, as well as like an art side of it. It's, uh, it's not an easy task, especially to get it to work with Quest and, and do all of that. So um, right now, it's uh you know we're in a pretty good spot uh we're trying to spice it up a little bit you know with some organs be that will be coming so for that disembowelment we're gonna have some pretty good stuff to look at or make you sick i don't want to touch too much on that but um but yeah uh, we, we are working on a skin shop um that you know players will be able to get skins from i can't go too much into detail with that right now but we've got a lot of really exciting stuff coming Oh, man, that's so cool. And for those folks who are just a little bit unfamiliar or maybe they've been playing the, the current version of Pavlov, can you talk about what exactly is gore? What are, we, what are you talking about when you say gore is coming? So, I mean, a lot of the people that were playing on uh, Quest before had gore, and, um, you know, it was really performance heavy, so uh, we had to have it take a backseat for a little while. Um, so we've pretty much redone the entire system from the ground up so that it it is optimized to work with the Quest. Um, 
and we're talking like dismemberment, you know, we can't, I can't speak too much on like any of the additives that will be happening with that, but we definitely, there's going to be dismemberment, um, and it's going to look really nice. Wow. So, I mean, really realistic stuff. When you shoot somebody, stuff's going to happen, right? We're going to see some blood. We're going to see some dismemberment. Uh, it's not going to be like it currently is. So it should add a real, real interesting aspect of realness to the game. Yeah, we're going to get some real nice visual feedback this time. And uh, hopefully the players will enjoy it. Oh, man, that's so exciting. I know a lot of folks have been asking for gore. And it seems like, at least from kind of tracking some of the conversation that's da that Dave has had around it, uh, it looks like you'll have an option to either enable gore or disable gore as well. Yeah, I feel like that's really important considering um, the the little mi the, the micro details that'll be added. Um, it, it might actually make people sick or a little squeamish. Anyone, anyone that's a little bit squeamish might want to turn that off. I mean... You know, you look at blood long enough, you might get a little, you might get a little squeamish. So, <laughs> well, there you go. It'll be tough to tell if it's the virtual reality or the blood that's making me want to throw up. But either way, <laughs> the result the is PC the same. players will certainly be be having to figure that one out for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very exciting, and I know everybody's looking forward to gore. Uh, we'll see what happens. I know Dave's been uh, talking about the new RC, the release candidate. Uh, maybe it'll make it in. Maybe it won't. Uh, I'm not sure, but sounds like it's going to be a certainty for the store launch uh, when it goes official on Oculus. So we'll really stay tuned and look forward to that. Thinking about the skins, and I know, you know, Jump was on and talked about it a couple episodes ago, um, and I'm not asking you to, to do any spoilers or reveal anything secretive, but I think the ones that are out there now uh, are pretty well known. You've got, you know, the obviously the, the Jer uh, Jared Deagle, and you've got... Uh, some of the other ones that are out there. Is there a particular one that's your favorite that's currently in circulation? My favorite one at the moment is the is the Dragon Op. I think that it is just a uh, a really pretty skin to look at. We will have a lot of beautiful creations heading uh heading the way of the players. And I know a common question that's been asked several times is, are these dev exclusives? Um, the answer to that is no. There's there's a few skins that are for like long term Patreon subscribers and you know possibility for even some of the newer subscribers to attain some skins going forward um, because of Patreon support. But um, a lot of the other skins like Wave Trip Five Seven, the uh, the Dragon Op, you know uh, things like that will will be available to the player. Um, right now it's just kind of like little test runs. That's why the devs have them. Um, the Jared Deagle is a dev exclusive though. So, um, <laughs> the only way to get that one is to have us drop it on the crown for you. I'll be the body. Oh, a traitor. Wait, Wait Foxtrot? Foxtrot is a developer? What? Yeah, exactly, bro. Cool as fuck. I've been in a game with him before earlier. He's cool. Who's detective? I'll be the bodyguard. We'll do it like this. We're gonna do it like this. Well, it certainly adds a cool element to the game, and I've had the privilege of thanks to you and Coda and a few other devs of, of playing with the Jared Deagle. It's really a cool weapon, and look forward to seeing more of that in the game. I know Junt drew a pretty pretty solid line in the sand. Uh, you know, just about being respectful of World War II and the history and everybody that fought and died. So it, it kind of seemed like, you know, if anything was going to happen to World War II skins, it would be very limited, very, um, you know, respectful, not some kind of anime and, and that kind of stuff. I guess yeah, I'm, um, I'm curious about kind of how you draw your inspiration for the skins and, and what that kind of, and, and again, not asking you to reveal anything that's secret, but where do you get your inspiration and, and how do you kind of make that process work? Um, so I have the absolute pleasure of working with another developer, David Sheep, which is our concept artist, and he comes up with just insane designs. And uh, what I do is I take those designs and I, I make them applicable to the real life, you know, on a weapon, make them feel worn, you know, damaged and um, lived in, you know, that kind of aesthetic and, you know, try to represent his vision the best way I can. But, you know, it's concept. So at the end of the day, um, there are some variations and changes. And sometimes 
little neat ideas come along in the design process and they're twerked and you know they're tweaked rather and just you know turn into something just really special in the end of the day and not all of the designs are you know conceptualized exclusively through David Sheep however majority of them are and I am not the only one working on these uh, on these skins Dan a new developer at the bankrupt studio is also working on that as well as weapon charms as you guys may have seen Wow, it's just going to be so many cool things, and hopefully we can uh, figure out what this microtransaction shop looks like and, and figure out you know how to buy these things and keep them and, and all that. I know folks have really enjoyed seeing the ones that are in the game now, especially the, the Patreon AK. I get killed you know repeatedly for folks to steal that off my dead corpse. <laughs> what, what was the inspiration for that color scheme? Because that one is really unique and definitely stands out when you're in game. That one is an original from me. Uh, Dave approached me one day and he, he said, you know, our Patreon subscribers need a, need a cool weapon skin. You know, we promised them this and he wanted to make good on that promise. And so I, <laughs> the inspiration is completely made up. I brought that AK into substance and I started doodling. <laughs> well, it looks magnificent, and uh, <laughs> kudos to you. Now, did you have a hand in the uh, in the quality assurance team uh, pistol, the one with the Crayolas as bullets? Yeah, that's an exclusive by me as well. Um, with the direction of our community manager, Junt, he, uh, he he said we need a QA skin, and I said, all right. And then he's like, we should do something with crayons, and uh, that's how the... Uh, the QA tester skin was born. <laughs> I mean, the cool thing about that one is even in the even in the magazine, if you pull it out, or even in the chamber when you you know pull the gun back, you can actually see the Crayola bullets inside the chamber. Yeah, that's really my favorite part. I also do kind of like the dinosaur chase and the QA team on the other side, but I I really do enjoy just like looking at crayons when I look in my mag. My <laughs> well, I got to say, the dinosaur always reminds me of Google when I, I don't have internet connection, so I do appreciate oh, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. I actually never thought of it. So, you know, originally, Pavlov, you know, I don't want to say caught flack, but I guess, you know, to be candid, one of the criticisms was, gosh, all you guys are doing are going to the marketplace and just getting assets and then putting them in the game. I mean, now as we sit here in 2022, the team has just exploded and you just named off a few devs. I know some people don't even know who these new guys are, but you know, that kind of a comment or that kind of a criticism, my goodness, there's no way that's even applicable now in 2022. I mean, you guys are really making things anew just for this game itself. Well, you have to realize the beginning of bankrupt and Pavlov Dave was pretty much a one man show and he was just gradually hiring other developers to help him as as pavlov grew and um you know as that happened as artists were added as more programmers were added our ability increased and that and thus you know we have replaced everything from from pavlov with original models made by a you know hired artists working at the studio so um you know i i've done a lot of the work for ttt and the hide all of all of the items on your chest you know i've i've made all that you know um, wow that's amazing so, I, I think a lot of people don't even know or even appreciate how much time goes into something i see the suggestion channel filled up with you know add this gun add that gun add this gun all day long and i i mean just curious like to make a you know flash grenade or a syringe or a world war ii type item like how long does something like that even take to get it perfected everything everything that you make you know the time varies, you know what I mean, based on complexity, you know. Sometimes a simple model can take a long time just because the texture is complicated. You know, sometimes a complex model can be have can have a really simple texture, but like the shapes are really challenging and, you know, things of that nature. And sometimes you make something and you never even use it because <laughs> it 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 designed it it's been decided that it doesn't fit, you know, the design anymore and we decide to go with something different and you you're totally making something different. So I mean, it, it, it's, it's all relative. So there's been a, a tremendous amount of, you know, interest in the new engine upgrade. I got to imagine some of the stuff you're doing, I mean, just right now, PC and Shack are so different. I would have to think there's some kind of design consideration in this for Shack and this for PC. 
What exactly is this engine upgrade going to do in for your world? Is this going to make your life easier? Is it going to make creating new assets easier? Like what, what's kind of the end goal in this, at least as it relates to what you do? Um, the engine upgrade is, is in relation to what myself and the rest of the artists at Bankrupt do. Uh, it, it, it's not really, a you know, a wrench in the gears or anything like that. You know, the, the, the process is still the same. We have to, we have to be very, very cognizant of like poly count when it comes to working on stuff for, for quest, you know, or for stack rather. And we have to be, you know, cognizant of like texture, you know, when it comes and when it's in relation to Shaq as well. But I mean, other than that, we don't, it, it's, it's all basically the same workflow. It's nothing really changes there. Oh, okay. Well, it does sound like the new engine upgrade is going to provide a lot more stability and a lot more, you know, optimization. So it seems like the game should run smoother, but it, I guess it's a good thing. It doesn't sound like you're going to have to go back and, you know, remake a ton of assets or something for it. No, because when when we make assets for the game, we're, we're we're thinking about optimization from the start. You know, um, there's there's a workflow that you follow as an artist. You know, for game assets, and um, typically you don't have to redo it as long as you don't do it wrong in the first place. Measure was it measure twice and cut once, as they say. <laughs> Sometimes you still got to cut twice just because things change, but. <laughs> <You> know, generally <laughs> so if we could talk a little personal if you don't mind i'd love to know kind of about your background and what led you on this journey and ultimately got you here at bankrupt oh boy all right well it all started when i was a little wee lad no just kidding <laughs> um but i have always been into art right you know as a kid i was like nine years old like drawing pikachus and stuff you know um just drawing on my own and um, oddly enough, I didn't even follow that path. I wasn't actually the best student in like high school or anything like that. And um, I actually didn't even go to college until I was like 22, you know. Um, but I did decide I have this like epiphany one day, and I'm like, ah, oh, man, you know, what are you doing with your life? You know, you need to go, you need to go do something. So my my best friend was uh, joining the army, and I was like, well, man, there's nothing left here in this town for me. I need to go. You know, I need to go like spread my wings a little bit and go experience life. Well, um, I joined the military um, back in uh, 2012, and I got out in uh, 2015. And, uh, I was an infantry soldier in the army, and uh, after that, I uh, I experienced a little bit of like trade work for a little bit, and I said, "This isn't for me. I can't do this the rest of my life." And uh, and so a buddy that I had inspired to go to college while I was still in the military called me up and he said, hey, man, remember what you said to me when you were in the army and I was and I wasn't doing anything. He's like, you told me, what are you doing with your life? And and then you told me to go to college and I did that. And look where I am now. He's like, I'm telling you the same thing right now. And I said <laughs> and I said, F it, I'm going to do it. And in that exact moment, I drove to the school, Full Sail University, and you know, I, I put in my application and I, I stayed there for two degrees. I got um, a bachelor's in computer animation and game art and uh, proceeded into military simulation. Wow, that's a heck of a story. I had no idea. Well, thank you for your service. That's really adds a whole nother dimension. I guess that's why you're so specific on some of these weapons and really give that extra care and compassion towards them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I named my M4 Sally in, in the army, so I, I got a little I got a little backstory on that. But um, am I hearing there yeah, might be a, a maybe a Sally skin in the future? <laughs> I I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> so you're going to full sale, obviously really respected uh, for you know design and graphics and all that kind of stuff. What are the like, what are the real tools of the trade? I mean, I, I'm very naive at this stuff. I've made a few maps here and there, but it seems like everybody's talking about, you know, Photoshop and Blender and these types of things. What are some good programs if you want to learn this space and get started out? Where, where should you be focusing your time? What program should you really be learning? Well, um, programs are relative. So you need to think about what you want to specialize in. Um, right now, I would be considered a 3D generalist um at for bankrupt but um 
you know, there's, there's several disciplines. There's character art, there's um, prop artists, there's environment artists, there are concept artists, there is technical artists, animators, special VFX artists, um, you know, and need to find what your niche is and like what you enjoy doing. And, um, and then you, and then you find out what softwares you need to achieve that. So essentially, for example, if you want to be a, uh, a prop artist, you would pick up softwares like 3ds max, Maya blender, you know, and those are 3d modeling. Those are like the three major 3d modeling softwares that, that are, you know, applicable right now. Um, Maya is still the industry standard. Blender is, you know, close behind. 3ds Max is really good for architecture and design type of work, but it's still applicable in a lot of things like gun modeling. Um, and inside of the modeling um, bracket, there are things like weapon artist and, you know, things of that nature, like that are very specific disciplines because gun modeling is extremely difficult and intricate. And character art is extremely difficult and intricate, you know, so it, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of time. So generally, like artists will become really good in one thing. They're not generally 3D generalists. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, and when I came to bankrupt, I was hired as a prop artist, but I, I do a lot more than just prop work now. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that your portfolio has really expanded as well as the whole bankrupt team. It's really exciting. How much of that 3D art would you consider? I mean, do we talk about things like animations and actually figuring out if I pull the pin off the grenade, what that, what is that going to look like? Or how does it actually get, get rigged up? That's a good question. Um, so our tech artists will generally handle that um, as far as how that functions. But you, as at the 3D artist level, um, you need to... When you're building that asset, you need to you need to physically think about how is this thing going to be handled. You need to imagine how it works. You need to look at schematics, diagrams, anything you possibly can to to understand the mechanics of what you're making. And then you have to model it like it's built so that it functions in VR properly. So if you're talking about pulling a pin from a grenade, that pin needs to be removable. And when you remove that pin, it needs to look like it's supposed to when you take the pin out. Look when you flick the spoon off. All that needs to look, you know, but like it should, or you know, a very conceptualized version of it that makes sense to real life. Um, and that wow. is the biggest challenge for VR modeling, as opposed to just standard game modeling, because a lot of the stuff in normal games, the player never sees. Right. Therefore, it doesn't even need to be created in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I guess just thinking about the challenge with VR, you never really know what angle someone's going to be looking at an item from, or. If you've got a teammate, I suppose you've got to account for that angle too with somebody else you know, viewing it as a third party. The answer to that is every angle, generally. <laughs> because right. because the, I always see players in game just holding up a weapon as close as they can to their face and looking at every single nook and cranny of the weapon or the knife or whatever object they've decided to pick up. So it, you really have to pay attention to every angle that they can physically see that isn't an internal component that is occluded by something. Wow, that's a lot to think about. And I suppose, you know, I know we've been working with OpenXR and trying to get the hand placements and, and all of that stuff proper. Um, I suppose that's kind of a challenge for other team members too, just thinking about I've got this asset, the hands are supposed to go on and grip the gun or, or you know, reload the gun in a certain manner. You don't want to mess too much of that up because I guess you probably don't want to have to send that asset back to you to get reworked. Thankfully, um, you know, the team is pretty good with like, talking to each other about how, how things are supposed to be set up initially so that, you know, everything falls into line when it's, uh, when it's brought into the game. So there, you know, there are specifications that are given to the artists, um, they need kind of as guidelines that they need to follow, um, scale guidelines and things like that to make sure that the systems that are already in place for example, guns and grenades and things, your knife, you know, all falls into place as, as, as it should. Right. And I suppose the biggest challenge is the left-handed people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not talking about anybody, <laughs> Wes, <laughs> but always oh, yeah. kind of a challenge to keep those lefties happy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. So talk about, I guess you got, okay, so you got out of the army, you went to the university, you got your two degrees. What leads you to the front door of bankrupt? <laughs> this is a... Uh... 
this is an interesting story as well. Um, so I was doing military simulation. I was working for a company called Logistics Services International. Um, and they essentially manufacture military parts for aircraft and also um, training simulations and combat sims. And so I was I was working on um, on a, a combat rescue helicopter for the Navy, modeling everything down to the bolt in 3ds Max. This is where this is that part where I'm saying the software is relative to what you're doing. Gotcha. Because I don't use 3ds Max now. I use Maya, but um, I was doing that for a while, and I decided to go pursue medical simulation. So I moved out to the Midwest and um tried to get into that it didn't work out it just it didn't work out at all <laughs> so um so you know i was down on my luck for a little bit and i was just you know freelancing around and you know taking like a part-time job you know what i mean make the bills get paid sure um and uh one day i ran into mott flyer um playing a vr game ironically and, uh, you know, I, I told him, like, I made 3D models, and he he saw my stuff, and he liked it. He was like, hey, you want to work on a mod with me? And then Dave saw my stuff and offered me a position. Wow. Well, that's a heck of a story. <laughs> yeah. And at Vancrypt and happy ever since. Yeah. it's We're going – we're over a year and a half now, so. Wow. So is the – Nickname or screen name Foxtrot is that a shout out to your past military history? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's just part of the phonetic uh, phonetic alphabet. Um, gotcha. You know, and and now people just call me Fox, and because people call me Fox all the time, I I kind of adopted that little animal as just like a representation of myself in the Discord and whatnot. But essentially, Foxtrot has been you know a universal name for me across the board. Well, I do like the little fox creature. He's really the softer side of Foxtrot. That's a uh, that's a another shout out to David Sheep. Um, <laughs> he also designed the PFP for this uh, Discord logo. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us kind of a sense of what does a typical day in your life look like? Oh, well, the first thing I do generally every day is get up and head to the gym. That is the first thing I do every single day, except for Sunday. Um, and I usually spend about an hour and a half in there. I can Just, verify yeah. that. I've seen several uh, videos, pictures, <laughs> uh, messages yeah. when you're at the gym. So I know that it's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you got to keep your fitness going, especially if you if you have a job where you work in front of your computer all day. And, you know, s sometimes it's not it's not the nine to five you know, that you're in front of your computer. Sometimes you're pulling those long hours because you get obsessed with a project and you're just sitting there 10, 12 hours later and you're like, oh, I got to sleep, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, first thing I do is, you know, get the exercise in, you know? And, um, you know, I, I do really enjoy going fishing. So I'll sometimes do that after work on, you know, my off time and uh, going on hikes and, you know, exploring some national parks and stuff like being in nature. It's a good way to break up the technology and um, see some of the world's beauty. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's been, uh, it's been nice. It's well, I know it's been really hot the last couple of days, but it's been nice yeah, it to, has. to see spring and summer coming. One of the nicest things I invested in over the pandemic was a standing desk. So I don't feel like, uh, you know, just sitting at my desk 12 hours, I can actually stand and uh, feel like I'm at least a little bit healthier. You know, I thought about the standing desk. I just never, I never committed to it. I thought about it several times, actually. Yeah, I've got, well, I've got four of them now. So they're all throughout the house. I got my wife yeah, well, one. Everybody's got one. So it's. Jeez, uh, yeah, send me one. Yeah, I'm, me you one can get them right on Ikea for just a couple hundred bucks. I mean, it's not bad. It's crazy. You know, yeah. You got to assemble it yourself because it's Ikea. But <laughs> can, I, can, can it handle three monitors? Yeah, I've got three monitors on mine. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So I know TTT has got to be somewhat near and dear to your heart just because of all the hard work you, you put into it. What is probably your favorite, I guess, favorite prop or favorite item you can get in, in the new TTT version? Uh, you know, I, I made a World War II knife um, a, a long, it was like a long time ago. And uh, 
I made it like as a concept and you know we never really adopted it but it was just kind of sitting there and you know I couldn't find an application for it until the push game mode came um and we added it to push and then I was thinking I was like you know at the beginning of TTT when I first got hired and I I wasn't I wasn't a great artist I wouldn't say at the beginning you know I feel like I really came into my like came into my own like progressively as I was met with challenges that were just sink or swim constantly in the beginning, you know, and uh, and so I had a knife, I had a kitchen knife that I that I had modeled. Um, I wasn't proud of the texture, and the model was to me subpar. And I was like, you know what? Let's put that World War II knife in there. That would be interesting. And you know, I I really do like the the World War II knife, but I thought about making another kitchen knife. I don't know. I was thinking maybe Damascus steel or something next time. Ooh. But but we'll, we'll see. I kind of thought you were going to say either the riot shield or the flare gun is kind of what I thought you were going to say. No, um not at all. <laughs> In fact, I think I'm I think I might have to rework that flare gun. Oh man. So here's one and I don't know if you can confirm or deny, but I did see this pop up in the Discord yesterday. Will there be some kind of effect with the flare gun? that takes into account the new gore system. Mm. And if you can't say, you can't say that's fine. I don't want to bait you into an answer, but yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a comment on that one. All right. <clears throat> stay tuned. Stay tuned. We might find out more, right? <laughs> so thinking about your favorite game mode, what do you think? TTT, the hide S and D. I don't really see you in, in many S and D matches. It, it seem like I mostly find you running around TTT lobbies. You know what it is? Like, I, I play Pavlov for just, like, you know, the fun. And, and I feel like I get real competitive sometimes. And I'm not that great at S&D. Um, so, like, I, I have played it. And I've had good games. I've had bad games. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm usually pretty busy working on the game more than I am playing it. True, so, yes. Um, <laughs> so, I don't have a lot of practice time for S&D. Um, but it, but if I was uh, if I was gonna say favorite game modes, um, you know if I think TDM is 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 on the list because I I really just like getting in there and just shooting people, <laughs> you know <laughs> I like just getting in there and doing that just mindless just doing it. Um, but I kind of like TTT just you know to talk talk with other players and you know just just have a good time. There's some funny moments, um, one of which you uh, you and I got to experience recently. Yes, we've got a great clip of that, which we'll we'll drop in here to to see your. I didn't do it. I just followed your lead. But what a, a plan you devised here. That means you don't have to do that. You have a knife and still a traitor. So you should buy. You should buy that C4. Buy that four. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Uh, no, no, no shh, wait, wait. I'm gonna cover for you. You just get behind me and just dead. Do it. All right, let's go. Can I leave? Bro, I just joined the server. I'm taking a shit right now, bro. Hey, yeah, where's that guy that's taking a shit at? Look at the other side of the map. There's just a floating body. <laughs> it's it's just fun. I mean, you get in you get into those lobbies, and sometimes they're just they're just perfect setups for something really funny. Um. I do like the hide. I mean, unfortunately, I'm I'm terrible at both being the monster and not being the monster. So uh, I typically just get wrecked all the time. But you know, I'm there for moral support. You know, um. <laughs> a lot of cool stuff came in with the hide, though. I mean, the the trip mines I think are really cool. I I think, and I don't know to be honest with you, I haven't played hide for a while. Did those um, objectives are they still in, or did those end up coming out of the game? Um, so I modeled the objective, um, originally it was a design choice to try to, um, co coerce, uh, players from camping together so that the monster would have an easier time. 
Um, we've we've since decided to remove that. It wasn't it wasn't working out the way we intended. So, um, you know, that's that's a that's a model that isn't being used. That was a cool model, though. I really enjoyed the the noise and the sound and how it spun and everything, and, and even looked really good on Shaq, which is is hard to do, as you know. Yeah, we tried a couple new things um, with the hide, um, like in the interactive bandage that you can use, where you have to actually tear it open and stuff. Just a couple little interesting things to get the player in, interacting. So, thinking about kind of all the stuff that you've put in, do you have a favorite item that you've made? This is a this is a tough one. This is a tough one, Coley, because I, I generally don't ever really like anything that I do. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it, it's always like the next thing I make, I'm like, this is this is de- decent, or the next thing I make, this is decent, and then I go back six months and I'm like, oh man, that was garbage. You know, that's usually how it goes. Um, I guess right now, uh, I'm I'm pretty happy with some of the skins that I've been making, um, but. If we're talking about items, I enjoy the hides items over the the TTT items right now. I do like, um, you know, the modernized like syringe or the futuristic syringe. You know what I mean? Yeah, that um, one's really cool. The trip mine is fun. I, I like the bandage being interactive. Like there, I like things for different purposes. If that makes sense. Well, and it's got to be just. I mean, I don't know. When I make something and want to get it out there to the world. I've always got, you know, I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but I'm I'm really excited to share it with everybody. So I know some of these gun skins that you've been working on, I'm sure they're going to look fantastic. And I, I'm sure you're a little bit like, oh, let's get these things out here today, today, you know, let's get them out. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm itching about it a little bit, but I, but I think that, I think that waiting for these things to come out organically um, makes the, the wait worth it in the end. Well, I just, I can't wait to see the reaction by the community. I mean, you know, folks are just going to go gaga over them and love them. And you see the reaction for the few skins that are in the game now. So really excited to see how that works and uh, really looking forward to seeing what you've got planned for us. That should be, that should be really exciting. Yeah. I think actually the only downside to having skins in the game right now that, you know, are dev exclusive just to throw around to the players is that, you know, I just get murdered even if I'm trying to hand them to them. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back over the last year or so, what's one thing that you're very, very proud of? I think that I'm, I'm proud of like my contribution and the team's contributions to, to the game and just pushing it forward. I think we've come a long, long way as a studio and we've, we've done a lot of really innovative and organic things to Pavlov that have just really like revamped what it what it was and it's never been a bad game by any means but it's definitely improved drastically um by just bringing in this new talent and I'm not just speaking about like my contribution at all like the team like animation tech art programmers you know back end front end everybody you know have just made like extremely wonderful contributions to this um growing game and uh i'm just really excited to to see what what the players think of the next update yeah well and it's it's been such a joy to watch and just really fortunate to get to know so many of you guys i mean even as you mentioned just you know the addition of having someone dedicated to look at sound and and all the improvements we've had in sound it's just it's unbelievable and there's really not I mean, I don't play that many other VR games because I don't want to. I've, I've got limited time, and I want to spend my time on something that's fun and I enjoy. But the, the other games I play, they're just not there in terms of realism. In term, and, and I'm saying from a 3D modeling perspective, from a, an actual gunplay perspective, from a reloading perspective, and, and now you know from a sound perspective, just with all the wonderful things you guys have been able to do, it's, it's amazing. We have insanely talented sound engineers. We only have two working at the team doing all the sound for the entire game, and they absolutely kill it every time. Um, you know, like, sound is a major component of making a game good, especially in VR. You want, you're talking about immersion. Like, you, you need good sound design. Well, absolutely, and I guess that's one of those big differences between the you know the two D games, if you will, and the VR games, especially right. when you can nail that you know spatial sound 
where the gun is on your left and you hear the gun on the left or the S and D bomb is, you know, down the hall to the right and you hear it down the hall to the right. It, it just, without it, the game really isn't a VR game. I, I agree with that. Um, and you know, sound and visuals work hand in hand. You know what I mean? You can see one, you can, you see something and you expect it to sound the way it looks, you know, and that is, that is a challenge that sound engineers have to have to overcome every time a new item is brought into the game. Oh, true. And not only getting the sound right, but then also the actual mixing volume so that, you know, the players, the microphone, radio, the gunfire, everything is, is mixed equally uh, so that nothing's overpowering each other. I, I don't know how they do it, quite honestly. It, it's pretty fascinating to, to actually be in the game and, you know, fire a gun while talking on the radio, while hearing an S&D bomb, and, and all these things somehow, you know, combine to make this wonderful symphony that's, like perfectly mixed it's really quite incredible i mean even like our guys even go out there and record organic sounds from actual live weapons so i mean it's it, it's pretty incredible what they're doing what do you think some of your full sail professors would would say if they knew that you were working on pavlov um some of them do and they're happy <laughs> i can imagine yeah i mean this is this is the up-and-coming vr game and Certainly getting a lot of buzz. I'm really excited, you know, obviously for the store release. Um, I think the Discord, it sometimes gets a little bit unrealistic of expectations. And it's not just, you know, we again, we talked about this with Junt. I mean, it's not just the press of a button and, all you know, magically it's approved by Oculus and on the store. There's obviously going to be a lot more review process internally with, with Oculus and with Quest and, and everybody but, I mean, it seems like, gosh, the game is well on its way. I think Dave even tweeted today that uh, he's really feeling confident about submitting the game to Oculus in the near future and having it go through those next steps. At Bankrupt, we really emphasize quality. So when it, when it comes to putting something out, and I know everyone's been waiting for the RC and everyone's you know constantly asking every day, like, when's the RC? Did it come out today? Dave will never release anything that he believes is subpar because he believes that the players deserve a quality product every time. So, yes, everyone's waiting. Yes, I understand people are angry or irritated or, you know, annoyed. But at the end of the day, you you will receive a quality product. And that will be something crashing every single time you you start it. Something so jank that it's unplayable. Like these things, I don't think the players realize take a lot of time any introduction of new game modes or new weapons or you know things of that nature new completely new systems built from the ground up i.e gore scopes that kind of thing they come with their own challenges and they also come with bugs that need to be addressed before we can push it to rc and and feel confident in it you know so uh we, we'll we'll always hold that we won't we won't push anything out before it's before it's ready we just don't do that well i would be remiss if we didn't spend a little bit of time talking about workouts and diets and exercise oh. and all that fun stuff what can you tell us about this stuff if somebody wants to get into it is there a certain diet that you're following is there a leg day i know you're going to the gym six seven times a week like my goodness i can't do that but i could probably do two or three days a week where am i going to get the most bang for my buck here uh well, um, as far as diet's concerned, it's pretty it's pretty basic. We'll just break it down Barney style. All right, all right. A cal a caloric deficit. All right. So basically, you eat less than your maintenance calorie. Which if you go online, you can look up um your body weight like maintenance calorie. There's calorie calculated online. You can look up and it'll tell you what it is. And then you eat about five hundred to eight hundred less. You work out regularly. And you just, you know, don't don't skip your cardio and you're fine. Um, as far as, like, working out, it depends on how hard you want to go or what you're trying to achieve. Um, and your diet changes based on that. If you're losing weight, you need a caloric deficit. If, you, if, you're, if you're trying to put on some mass, you kind of, you want to bulk, you want a, calor, you want a caloric surplus. So but, what are I you mean, doing right now? I know you wake up the first thing and you go to the gym. Are you are you eating before you go to the gym, or are you just going right to the gym straight away? Um, I'm going to the gym straight away, basically. Um, I intermittent fast. I do my hour and a half workout and you know my 30 minutes of cardio, and 
then I come home and I eat. Uh, generally, you want one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass, which again, you can, you can kind of calculate that or go see a doctor for an accurate number. But uh, I mean, it's 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 pretty simple if you follow these little these little things. But I think the biggest thing is consistency for people. You know what I mean? Like yeah. staying consistent with it. Um, if you're consistent, your body changes. If you're not, it doesn't. Just like you do anything you do in life. If you're consistent, if you're consistent in practicing for something, you do well in it. If you if you're not, you don't. It's the same thing. You know what I mean? So you're you're spending about an hour and a half to two hours at the gym. You do what do you say? You're doing about thirty minutes of cardio, and then you move into weights, or what does that look like? Well, if I'm in there for an hour and a half, I've already hit the weights. I I do weights and I do cardio post. Oh wow! Okay. And you're doing that. So, I mean, is, is there such a thing as leg day or not really? Of course. I do two leg days a week. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. You need tree trunks, man. You want to look good. Well, there we go. So very, <laughs> very interesting, <laughs> actionable tips here from Fox. I mean, some of us put on some weight over the pandemic, Fox. I mean, we couldn't couldn't do what we used to do, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, my, my fiance was, you know, baking the sugar cookies, you know, 50 of them at a time. And, you know, here's... The, the, the craziest thing about that is that she doesn't even eat them. She just looks at them She's <laughs> oh, like them for the aesthetic. Yeah, I know. And I can't just let them sit there, of course. So if you are going to so, have a cheat day, what does that look like? Some uh, some beers, some cookies? What What's your favorite go-to cheat day items? Um, so there's no such thing as a cheat day. There's this thing as a cheat meal. You just generally want to have a cheat meal. Don't spend the whole day eating like garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing so many things wrong. No wonder why I'm not losing weight. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So but, any, like, will you go out and have a pizza occasionally or what does a cheat oh, meal yeah, look like? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Oh, okay, good. Hopefully definitely. not cooked on a pizza You got to live a little bit. You got to live a little bit. <laughs> Fox really balancing that lifestyle between fitness and occasionally a cheat meal to, to, keep, it, <laughs> to keep his sanity. You got to keep it real, yeah. We have a lot of younger folks, obviously. They, they love Pavlov. They love the game. They're in the Discord a lot. If you're in high school, if you're just starting college, what is some advice from, from Uncle Foxtrot? What are some things folks should be thinking about, worrying about, not worrying about? If you were had to do it all over again and go back to those high school days, what would your advice be? Don't be dumb. Get your grades up. Get through high school. Go to college. Definitely. You have to do that if you want to, like, I, I'm not saying you have to, because we, we have individuals that work at the studio that, that don't have the credentials of, of college. Um, so it's not impossible if you're talented, but I definitely recommend it to get those fundamentals down, you know, get that ingrained in you early and then have all this extra time to practice because, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually start doing 3D like professionally until I was 27. So, um, the earlier you do it, you know, the better you get, the faster you get into that, that dream job position that you want. Um, if you're trying to, to be a modeler, you know, download Blender, get, get your feet wet. You know what I mean? There's tons of tutorials on YouTube. Um, Udemy has a lot of good stuff. ArtStation has a lot of good stuff. Um, there's tutorials that are pretty ex inexpensive and could teach you a whole hell of a lot. Um, even today, I still will, will get in, get in there and try to teach myself something new every day, even if it's a, as simple as learning a new tool or a new way to build something, you know. Um, keep an open mind because art is ex extremely big. Um, there's just so much diversity in it. And, you know, you might think you want to be a prop artist and then, you know, halfway through a college degree and, you know, um, game art, you might decide, you know, hey, I want to, I want to model for film, which is is a totally different way of doing it, you know. Then you're talking about rendering and you know, compositing and VFX for film. It's it's a whole different industry. Um, I did both because I didn't know, you know what I mean. Um, so I did both degrees. I also had the GI Bill from the Army, and do not join the Army if you just want college. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> do not do that. Um, but I, I I do recommend you know going to school and, and learning that stuff. Um, but at the very least, you know get your feet wet. Blender's free. 
Um, it has sculpting uh, ingrained in it. It also has, you know, a multitude of tools and plugins. It's open source, so people are always constantly developing for it. It's it's a great way to learn. Um, but learning those fundamentals will give you a give you a head start, especially before you go to college. You get in there and you already know what you're talking about. You'll breeze through college. You'll learn what you didn't know. You can go out there and keep practicing and, you know, to get your shot. Um, the, the, the realm of game, game design and film is just, it's extremely competitive. So uh, whatever you do, you need to make sure you're extremely good at it. So if you want to be a character artist, you need to, and you, you need to be 100% about it and you need to grab onto that and you need to just work on that. And we're talking tirelessly work on that. You keep grinding on that until you, you're physically sick because there's somebody out there that's doing the same exact thing you're doing, trying to get your spot. So you have to work hard. Laziness will get you nowhere in this industry. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, you know, I, I often tell the, my students, I say, you've got to set yourself apart. And I think one of the really good ways to do that, especially, and you can certainly talk because you know way more about it than I do, but it would seem to me a really good way to do that is to build up a portfolio. Um, absolutely. So, I mean, you're going to realize as a growing artist that a lot of the work you do is just not going to be good at first. Um, but that's, you know, that's you growing, you're learning. But little by little, you'll improve. You'll learn new tools, different ways of doing it. You'll improve artistically and you will eventually become pretty pretty good um but you'll always be throwing out stuff from your portfolio and putting new stuff in that's just that's just that's just how being an artist is uh you know all of my college stuff is generally not there anymore you know because <laughs> i just wasn't it wasn't that good and you know that was me learning right um, but i think it's important for folks to see that progression right to see where you started where you're at and where you could potentially go i mean it, it shows personal growth and of course, professional growth too. Um, so that's a double-edged sword. Some people just decide to take that out of their portfolios com completely. Some of them will put that into like a little folder and say, you know, student work, you know, something like that, so that the so they can see that you can grow fast. Um, I think that's how I've got mine set up right now. Um, but you know, I haven't updated my portfolio in a long time, to be honest. I've been pretty busy. <laughs> well, true, very true. And thinking about the different applications for, you know, 3D modeling and, and 3D artistry, I mean, gosh, there's just so many. I, I mean, I never even thought of, you know, military applications until you were talking about your some of your former work today. It, it seems like this industry is just, I mean, it, it didn't really exist, you know, what, 30 years ago, but but now it's everywhere and it seems like there's a massive need for folks that know this kind of information. There is, and there is a lot of like, there's a lot of positions that you can get at different places doing different things. Um, I have friends that I went to school with that work for like Ashley Furniture, like doing all of their like furniture designs and things like that. I personally couldn't model a chair that long, so I, uh, you know, I'd like to move on to some, you know, more interesting things. Um, and and that brings me to another point. Whatever you do in this industry, make sure that you're passionate about it. If you're not, if you're not passionate about something, the result will not be good. That's a very good point. That'll, that'll shine through. And I think folks will be able to tell if you're, if you're putting your all in or if you're just, you know, punching a clock nine to five. Exactly. And this, this industry is not for the guy that punches the clock nine to five. You're not going to be a millionaire being a 3d artist, but you will feel fulfilled if you're doing something that you're passionate about. Excuse my complete ignorance, but if you're doing 3D artistry and, and making these things in 3D, is there some aspect of that that can be translated and actually printed out on like a, a 3D printer? All of it. Oh, wow. So, I mean, some of the assets that you've designed, maybe with some modifications, could actually be printed on a, a 3D printer? Yeah, it's all about just, just exporting your, your 3D model in a way that um, the printer can can print accurately. Um, some things need to be cut up in, in 3D in order in order to print correctly. You know, for example, if you're making a character, you'd ideally want to print the arms, and the legs separate from the torso and the head. You know, things like that. But um, it's it's really just exporting it in a in a 
a file format that uh, your printing software can read. Wow. Boy, oh boy, that's some good ideas for the Pavlov store, right? Forget the t-shirt. I want the uh, 3D printed, uh, you know, smoke grenade or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of that C4 that we <laughs> we use so effectively in TTT. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> well, I want you to put on your fortune teller hat, if it's possible. Obviously, you know, Facebook and Meta and Oculus and whatever name they're going by this week, they're looking hard into VR. They're investing, you know, millions upon millions of dollars. This is going to be the future, according to them. What do you see kind of as this future of VR? What are some things that you think we might see? What are some things you think aren't going to work well? Where do you think this whole VR field is going? And is it is it a field that you see yourself staying in for a long-term period? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that uh, VR is getting more traction the oculus quest 2 is very good for the vr community it gave people an entry level into it and i'm hoping that future headsets more powerful headsets will gradually become cheaper and uh, more accessible to the general populace so that you know vr developers and other you know game studios will take interest in that platform and start creating more content. Um, but I do believe it, that it is the future because it is the way more intuitive than than playing with mouse and keyboard or a controller. You know, you're in the game, you're face to face with somebody, even if it is looking at somebody's avatar. Any last thoughts you have? I appreciate your time today. It's been a hoot talking with you. We've covered a bunch of stuff. Is there stuff that we haven't covered that you want to talk about? How do folks get a hold of you? What's the best way to stay in touch with uh, all things Foxtrot? I'll generally speak in the Pavlov main discord. I, d I don't usually respond to DMs. Um, or it, other than that, you can pretty much find me playing the game. I play both on Shaq and, uh, and on House. But, I mean, if you do see me in, uh, in main chat, you can feel free to chat me up. Well, there you go. Well, thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, everybody I know is very excited to see what you've got in store for us. Uh, keep cranking away on those skins. I can't wait to get into the App Store and purchase a bunch of those and uh, and see them in-game. If they're anything at all like that that AK or that uh, Dev Deagle, boy, oh, boy, we are going to be in for a real treat, my friend. I'd like to think their they're, uh, league's better. Oh, so. my goodness. You're setting the bar very, very high. I, I'm confident. I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking some time out. It's always a pleasure uh, to, to chat with you and a great fortune to see you in game. We have a lot of fun when, when that happens. So thank you so much. Uh, congratulations to you and the whole team. Please pass on everybody a uh, big thank you from everybody. And we look forward to seeing that, that release candidate for Pavlov, uh, Pavlov Shack here in uh, hopefully the very near future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pavlov Podcast. As always, a big, big thank you to Vankrupt and their dev team, just outstanding individuals, and we really appreciate the opportunity to learn more about what's going on behind the scenes on our favorite game. This is your friend Kool-Aid Man saying thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll join us on the next Pavlov Podcast.